so um, yes, yeah, so now it's um, the time to discuss the uh, the issue of spread and also what it what are the potential implications um, on uh, income inequality eventually? So the next speaker, um, Dr. Salter, please. Dear ladies and gentlemen, Koni Shiva, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to briefly inform you about some results of an analysis we have done on behalf of OECD concerning the probable future impact of big data and analytics to employment and equity. To be precise, I have to define big data and analytics first. That is anything but easy. Sometimes maybe a joke will tell you the essentials, so let me try this definition first. It goes like this. Trying to get a correct answer to a question via big data and analytics Figuratively spoken is like trying to get inside knowledge about the behavior of a pig by analyzing all dishes of a huge number of potluck dinners with mathematical methods. That is a very brief description of what could be think what we could think about big data and analytics. To be serious, there is a big difference between the conventional ICT and data-driven innovations that lie in front of us with big data and analytics. Big data and analytics, that is the first part, is about providing a kind of manifest what by implementing value extraction in a flat and unstructured datafied universe of information threats with unknown veracity. And that is done to answer questions on the basis of approximation and correlation. The difference is that conventional data and analytics instead is about providing kind of know what, not manifest what, but know what, by implementing a kind of know why as value. And this is to answer questions on the basis of implemented causation. So the difference is mainly correlation instead of causation in the traditional field. So based on this very rough, but hopefully somehow precise definitions also of the differences, I will now try to precisely summarize some main results of our analysis. First, let us assume that ecological, societal, and economical sustainability via green and inclusive capitalism is our common goal. Second, let us further assume green and inclusive growth of GDP with a fair distribution pattern of entitlement and participation to be a prerequisite towards societal and ecological sustainability. Big data and analytics have a big potential into this direction. First, massive dematerialization of the production of goods and service seems to be possible with the help of new data-driven innovations. And this would be a prerequisite for green growth. And everybody could become what I, what I here named citizen of the cloud. And that means a possible workforce inclusion of nearly 5 billion people in the working age globally today. And this could be up to approximately 7 billion people in the working age population within the next 30 years. You have to have in mind that currently the employment and the number of employed people in the OECD countries is a little bit more than 500 million. And this number you have to compare 
to a probable workforce in the next 30 years of about 7 billion people. So on the one hand side, BDA could have a positive impact into that direction of green and inclusive growth and capitalism. But there is a but, and it is a big but. Since BD and A could have also negative impacts, I only want to mention here uh, the problem of total transparency. And the second is a possibility of a technologically induced unemployment. <clears throat> Concerning the impact of big data and analytics on employment, it is important that, as I described at the beginning of my short talk, correlation and statistical evidence lie at the heart of big data and analytics. The results, these manifestations, are qualitatively sanctioned by the law of large numbers. And that is why big data and analytics accelerates a societal move regarding decision-making from causation to correlation, from know why to manifest what. Via pattern recognition and quantitative reasoning, machines will tell us what to do and when. And there a warning has to be given, which is illustratively perfectly described from Nassim Taleb, who says, be careful, black swans do exist. For example, the financial crisis was not predicted by econometrics. And the big rating institutions have, via quantitative risk management, uh, rated a huge amount of securities as AAA, which become, some minutes later, toxic, toxic papers. So the best with this would thus be a teaming of humans and machines. And the key policy challenges results from the facts that, first, there are skills necessary far beyond a data-focused part of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which one abbreviates as STEM. Far beyond it is possible to enable people to detect in advance, so ex ante, those black swans via qualitative reasoning instead of quantitative reasoning. And this, this requires huge and multidisciplinary know-how and know-why. And second is the regulation of responsibility and, and accountability is necessary to enable people to override machine and correlation-based decisions in situations where qualitative reasoning or even what we call intuition or creativity contradicts statistical evidence. And the following question leads to such a situation where causation contradicts correlation. It is a question, what is a predicted What is a predicted impact of big data and analytics on employment? Some facts. McKinsey predicts the potential of big data and analytics to be 5% or up to 10% on productivity growth. And the focus of optimization, since productivity growth is mainly optimization of automation, the focus are middle wage jobs of last decades that are at stake. This would translate into an impact of OECD countries, where I mentioned already that there are a little bit more than 500 million people employed, actually. Five to 10 percent on productivity growth would translate, at the first step, to a job loss of 25 up to a little bit more than 50 million jobs. And what is left for humans? For, left for humans are jobs, high wage jobs, that need a high level of creativity and the uh, ability to handle situations of undecidability. 
And on the other hand side, jobs that do not need so much skills, but a high level of what I call manuality, that means the possibility of handle non-routine manual tasks, and which requires a high level of sociality. What is the good news about jobs eventually to raise up um, because of big data and analytics? The study comes to the uh, solution or to the prediction of 1.6 1.7 million decent job opportunities until 2018, which, would, could, which could be translated into a probable new jobs of 7 million um, decent job opportunities in OECD countries. And the big question is how to fill the, um, the, the job opportunity gap of which is then approximately 20 or 45 million jobs in the OECD, and how could we fill the, the possible job gap worldwide, which would be much, much higher. There, are, there is a correlation argument that answers this question in the form, says, don't worry. The principle of creative destruction remains true in the future. But nevertheless, a big if has to be added also if we follow this correlation argument, because to challenge the big, to, because to overcome the big challenge of massive growth of GDP, a fair and balanced participation and considering that our current ecological footprint is about 1.5 planets um, to, to overcome the challenge um, to reach sustainability requires a big transition. And this is called to us and told us even either in correlation uh, and causation. The causation argument considering the question what the Im predicted impact on employment is is different. Causation tells us this time is different. The argument is we will have probably technological unemployment due to an accelerated innovation cycle, to accelerated innovation cycles and innovation speed. Through all, um, yeah, it's one argument is Moore's law. And another argument comes from Professor Sergei Kapitza, a member of the Club of Rome, who, um, who has figured out that through all history, the speed of innovation has been a quadratic function um, with respect to the number of people living on Earth. So thus, a technological obsolescence of human capabilities um, have to be considered even if we consider lifelong learning. The key policy challenge from this would be societal innovations and corresponding regulations are needed to ensure fair entitlement and participation, a fair share in GDP. And this huge challenge requires well-founded political efficiency through broad skills far beyond a data-focused STEM education and lifelong learning. What is the consequence? One could summarize concerning the question whether in the next future the statistically evident paradigm of the creative destruction remains true to overcompensate the expected job losses in the middle wage segment due to the big data and analytics induced productivity growth. Or let us, um, let us uh, ask this question from the opposite side. So we could ask concerning the question whether we will witness a high level of technological unemployment and a winner-takes-it-all economy, it has to be concluded that causation contradicts correlation. Thus, is, thus the key policy suggestion is seriously consider the possibility that big data and analytics will have negative impacts on employment and equity in the next years to come. 
And the key policy challenge would be, figuratively spoken, we globally need a set of mandatory tournament rules. Globally, we need an adequate musical arrangement to effectively run or dance with machines in sustainable harmony. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Um, as I suggested, I wanted to um, have your active participation. So uh, let me first ask um, if anyone in the, um, in the audience has uh, questions. Yes, please. Pinda. Okay. Uh, lots of questions because I want to cheat for my last session of the day. Um, questions, <laughs> <direct> <laughs> um, questions actually directed to Dirk, but also any of the panelists can um, chime in. Um, in terms of the different scenarios that you mentioned, dancing with the machines, that's a lovely image. Um, are there def uh, default positions, for example, with respect to privacy, that you can, that should be considered to avoid this gap that you present that in jobs that will be inevitable? Well, not ine inevitable, but that you project. So if, if, the, if the future scenario is there's going to be a big impact, and that big impact with respect to jobs is going to be negative, and that there is a gap that will be created, how can you smooth that out? Are there any, are there any um, ways that we can manage the transition more gracefully? Thank you. So should I answer it directly or should we? I think, is there any, um, are there any related questions to that particular, okay, yes, please. <laughs> Um, Mr. Mr. Wyckoff, please. No, exactly on this point, I guess I'm curious on your observations when you've seen other large general purpose technology induced structural changes, whether it be mechanization of agriculture or then manufacturing. Agriculture took arguably 100 years to play out manufacturing maybe 50 or 70. Do you sense that this transformation is happening much faster? And um, if so, it goes to Pinder's point. How do you begin to smoothen? Um, we're kind of running out of sectors to push people into. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, where they will end up? And if I could just, Christian, going to Atakasan, uh, your remarks about data scientists and, and the movement and the need for uh, focusing on these skills seems to contradict a little bit what Jacob said yesterday that the software will be in place so that these skills aren't as badly needed as we think. Um, can you respond to that contradiction? Yes, please. Yeah, I tried to, to answer this question as, as short as possible, but, but for sure it's, it's very difficult. It's, it's the most difficult question. What I said is causation tells so. And there are several arguments of causation. The first is the question, which kind of jobs disappear? At our research institute, we have, a, we have developed a four-level architecture of human capabilities. Um, which have two levels on a sub-symbolic uh, layer and two levels on a symbolic layer. On the top is theory, then comes rules, and on the bottom are sensoric and actuous. So it's the lowest layer. And in the middle, in the second layer from above is a layer of pattern recognition and um, the, the pattern recognition mainly, and, and intuitivity and creativity would be to translate patterns detected into symbols so that they can be worked out in rules or even in theory. Computerization came from top. First you had calculations, so it was directly theories. 
Then we have rule-based systems, so that was the second layer. And at the same time, automation comes from the bottom um, because sensors, actuators are even better as any humans that we have. So, and, and today, we, we try to automize and we are able somehow to automize the last layer of human capability. And what's left is, is only the transition process between pattern recognition and to give them symbols. And even um, computer systems can make symbols out of patterns and work with them. So that means the new phase of innovation detects what has left in the last 30 years for human activities. So this makes it very, very difficult to find new slots where humans can actively work. It's the first argument. Because it has to be then also outside the needs must segment, because the needs must segments, the goods and services that we need are highly automated. And so new jobs, by the help of creative destruction, should be in the nice to have segment. What is the problem there? The problem is our current ecological footprint is about 1.5 planets. And as, ever, as everybody know, some natural resources are needed for any kind of products and services. Um, it is energy. You need energy for everything. And the current ecological footprint is 1.5 planets. That's why we are dealing with topics like disaster management. Because partly it comes from our over-exploitation of natural resources. That is the second argument. And the third argument is the unemployment gap is much, much bigger than the 25 to 50 million people in the OECD. If we really mean what we say, if we say we want globally to have a green and inclusive capitalism, it would mean we have to solve, or we have to bridge the large gap of nearly 5 billion people who would like to be employed, and this could be up to 7 billion in the next 30 years. And I have so a little bit doubts that we really could easily solve that problem, and that's why I uh, came to the conclusion that a policy challenge is to find societal innovations for entitlement and participation, and this could be, for example, like uh, in this new book, um, a kind of um, basic income. And the European version would be a kind of unconditional basic income. The US version uh, would be a negative um, income tax. This would force people to employment. That's would, why we would um, propose to, to have this unconditional uh, basic income as a kind of social solution. So it takes time to answer your question, but it was, no, I tried to make it fast as possible. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Just before um, Ataka-san respond to the question, I just wanted to highlight one aspect uh, of just what you said, which is it seems to be that um, because you mentioned the last layer, which seems to be now within the realm of um, artificial intelligence, um, but at the same time we see that um, also um, thanks to the present, uh, presentation of Ataka-san, um, that there is still um, a kind of a area where, um, which is involving creativity, which is involving yeah. also um, the identification of problem areas and opportunities, which um, I think, and this is the question, whether machines have reached that, that level. <coughs> so uh, first, to answer Andrew's question, so I think there, is a, there was a difference in the definition between what uh, uh, Jacob yesterday called a data scientist and what we are calling a data scientist today. So when Jacob was talking about a data scientist and he was pessimistic about uh, this being becoming obsolete because of software, he was thinking about very routine <clears throat> tasks like uh, ex, you know, Excel sheets or even statistical significance tests or very simple things to, with, with data. And those things <clears throat> will become obsolete. They are mu done much better by, by machines, by computers. But the kind of things that we, are talk we were talking about today is creative problem solving, applying 
an ICT technology to solve a problem using uh, complementary technology in a different area, that is not something that's going to be obsolete that easily. And I think there are many opportunities still there, despite the, the gloomy uh, prognosis from uh, Dirk. <clears throat> About the longer term question, you know, uh, whether machines are capable of <clears throat> these kinds of cognitive skills, we got the neuroscience uh, perspective on this. And I can add a computer science perspective. So, uh, people like Ray Kurzweil and uh, Nick Bostrom, they talk about the singularity and the superintelligence uh, uh, period arriving reasonably soon, and that's because, I guess, they have been, uh, uh, they're following the, the, the dramatic advances in computing power and so on, lead them to make, uh, you know, speculations about that scenario. But if you look at it from a computing, computer science foundational viewpoint, there are very serious theoretical reasons why you you cannot necessarily expect such things to happen. There are so Dirk pointed out to you know the uh, there are some problems which are inherently undecidable, but even if they are not undecidable, many of many problems are known to be computationally intractable. This is a very f old and famous area in computer science called NP completeness, yeah. computational intractability. There are limits, fundamental limits on what computers can do from a computational basic mathematical computational point of view. So <clears throat> it is not necessarily that uh, clear that the singularity in the super intelligence phase where uh, machines take over completely is actually ever going to be possible. It's legit to speculate about it, but there are very serious theoretical reasons why those obstacles, those fundamental obstacles are not going to be breached that easily. Hmm. Um, Dirk wanted to say something and then we have a question by Professor Obi. It is yeah, I do not want to to be dooming. It is only I want to, to to make the point clear that there are very huge political challenges to be dealt with now. And then we go into a positive and good future mm. from my point of view. And with respect to the to the question which is left for humans, I absolutely agree. It is creativity, it is this kind of facility to deal with situations. In, in, in undecidability problems. The big question is whether we are allowed to do so if we have this paradigm of correlation. So the big problem will be if we are able to raise new questions, will we get really innovative answers from correlation machines if none of humans are willing because of probable liability if somebody overrides, for example, the diagnosis that is done by a machine, will there be a physician willing to override what the computer has suggested as a treatment? And will this, this physician will take over then the accountability for this overriding? So the question is, if we raise new questions, creativity, uh, whether we get real innovative answers if we focus on these correlation machines. Mm. This is a point that I would try to make clear, and this is a high, high political challenge mm. to be dealt with. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yuko Hayama, formerly working for the OECD, but now I'm working for the Japanese government. Uh, just a short question. The title of this session is Promoting Skills for the Data-Driven Economy. And we were talking about data scientists mainly and only. Mm, mm. My question will be, if we are moving to the data-driven economy, a huge amount of consumers should have new attitude, mm. new way to make decisions, mm. and we need to have some kind of new skill set. Mm -hmm. And I'm not re reducing this skill set into the ICT literacy that we used to say. Mm. But uh, it's a huge transformation. And we need to take care of these big parts, consumers mm. and users. Mm. Just my question. Thank you very much. And if, uh, if I may add to, to underline indeed um, that this is an area that we have missed um, we have been also working in that respect, um, in, in, uh, in, on, in, in particular in the area of children, on um, the awareness of um, security and privacy risks. 
and there seem indeed to be a need to, to, to raise awareness. And I think this is also something maybe um, the panelists could, could also address, like um, how can we increase awareness and also the basic literacy in how to deal with, with many of the issues that we are encountering in the data-driven um, data economy. Um, so the next um, is uh, Mr. Esmeyer in the back. Thank you. I think my question is a bit similar, and, and privacy and security are one thing, but a lot of the things that are mentioned in terms of skills are creativity, entrepreneurship, yeah. uh, both for data scientists, but these are all uh, apparently things that are hugely important for the, the jobs that are left for humans, and currently these are not addressed in the curricula and in the educational system, so lifelong, lifelong learning doesn't really exist. Neither does creativity, problem solving, and uh, creativity are part of the curriculum. So I think that's one of the challenges as well. And I yeah. think I'm, I'm interested in how the panelists think about that. Yeah. Thank you very much for this question. And if I may also um, add to that one, uh, that in our work on ICT skills and employment, it turned out to be also one of the, the, the key issues, like entrepreneurial skills. So while um, the university system, or let's say third level education has been focusing a lot on providing the ICT skills or high tech skills, um, very few initiatives have really focused on promoting entrepreneurial skills, which are, however turned out to be also very difficult to train um, in a formal context. So the next question, please. Yes. Yes, I have a question for uh, Mr. Sch uh, Solte regarding the uh, global challenge of um, uh, future labor. Um, and you mentioned the um, ideas about um, unconditional income. Um, but where should this policy discourse actually happen? The OECD is very small, and uh, in the UN circles, I think um, this kind of idea is not yet very advanced. And uh, I think overall, there are very few economists who uh, would probably support such ideas at the moment. And we can follow the discussion in Switzerland at the moment on unconditional income. So where do you see hope for grand societal uh, problem solvers? OK, so if there is no questions, yes. So I would like the panelists maybe um, we could start, I don't know, who wants to start? Um, I think maybe f addressing the question um, by um, Harayama-san first on the skills and if we should actually, what are the implications if we look at broader issues and beyond data scientists? Uh, who want to take a first shot on that? Yeah, Dirk? Should I start? I yes, please. And, and from my perspective, okay. I, I would combine these, uh, the, the three questions. Uh, this is my point of view. Uh, I would say, um, I mentioned the aspect of political efficiency. And this means that, that citizens as member, as a responsible body in a democracy should, be, should have enough knowledge uh, to deal with the huge challenge of the big transition that lies in front of us. So that's why I would suggest to have more time for education in the beginning and during the life. And this could be combined to solve partially the problem um, of the job gap that we have. So we sh one solution would be simply not to work so much, <laughs> but to have more time for lifelong learning and education, especially in the beginning or in the first 20 or 25 years of your life. To become then a citizen which really feels political efficiency internally and externally. So the question is how this kind of additional knowledge which, is, which far goes beyond this data focused STEM, science, technology and so, uh, which, which needs a lot of orientational knowledge about this, this highly dynamic system we are living in. So this kind of knowledge is, is the additional knowledge that should have to come on top 
for everybody of us. We have to understand these sustainability issues. We have to understand the pressure under which politicians are working. We have to understand the pressure and, and under which management of companies are working. We have to understand the pressure that comes from, from uh, investors and so on. We have to understand the worldwide financial system as well. And this is a kind of orientation and knowledge that has to come on top. One hope that, that we have is that the ongoing discussion about, for example, on the OECD level, um, the discussion about green and inclusive capitalism, and also the discussions in the World Trade Organization or now in the bilateral uh, trading agreement discussion, that we could eventually come or hopefully come to uh, the definition of mandatory so, um, social and ecological um, production and process standards for the production of goods and services. And the European solution would be to offer co-financing so that all countries would accept this as a deal. Co-financing if social and ecological standards are agreed to be mandatory, for example, within the uh, World Trade Organization and the co-financing could come from new financing sources that are needed also for mm. ecological problems and these and, and one proposal we give is a, a financial product duty. So if new mm -hmm. financial mm -hmm. products are implemented that there has to be a duty on it. It's not a transaction tax, it's a financial um, okay sustainable and stability contribution as for example uh, supported by IMF. So my hope is that we, we are willing on a global level to come to a deal, co-financing okay. for the acceptance of a social standard and then uh, an unconditional basic participation or however we call it could be such a kind of social standard to be agreed upon. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, if I can just supplement those remarks, <coughs> I think uh, these uh, issues about sustainability, they really need to permeate the curriculum at all levels. Uh, we, ha we do have it in Sweden at the university level. Sustainability is, is uh, m made a center point in across uh, all kinds of studies at the university, and they probably need to be taken up even earlier. <coughs> so I agree with that in, in, in general. <coughs> uh, um, Probably at the school level, you also need to develop uh, problem solving, algorithmic uh, thinking and so on amongst kids. That's the way to prepare them for the data driven economy, complement, complementing the sustainability viewpoint. And about the, uh, the question about the basic income and where support for that uh, can come from, I just wanted to give again a Swedish perspective. So, uh, so in in Sweden, uh, uh, in the po across the political spectrum, it is true that uh, that the, there is not that much support. But among two of the <clears throat> the leading parties in the political spectrum, the Green Party and the the Left Party, there are m grassroots movements for basic income within those two parties. So within those okay. two parties, at least, which is a significant, re quite a significant percentage of the Swedish population, there is support for basic income. And uh, your, your question was that it doesn't have support of uh, any economists. That's actually not true. If you look at even Brinjolfen and McAfee, who are uh, very mainstream economists, they are by no means radical economists. They are mainstream economists. And they do uh, support basic income, although in their case they favor the American version, which is the negative income tax. That has to do with the American versus the European points of view. And uh, you, you can find uh, other mainstream economists also supporting that. So it is not that uh, far left field an idea uh, uh, today. 